Hello there, internets. Earlier this week, Chapter 2 of Elite Dangerous's Beyond Season dropped, which is the first of two smaller updates that'll be coming here in 2018. The next update will probably be late summer, early fall, September. I'm looking probably the September time frame. Followed by the big update, which will be in quarter four this year, probably in December. That should also feature the release of, I guess, Season 4 or new pay DLC that we don't have any information about. We do have information that there are refinements coming to mining as well as exploration, and I have to say that what I saw in their LaveCon presentation impressed me from a game play perspective that they're fleshing out those mechanics, which are vastly long overdue. But at the same time, at least in the mining aspect of things, it still doesn't answer a fundamental question of why should I want to engage in mining? I'm happy for those who do like to do it, that they're making it more engaging where there's an element of skill-based gameplay, it looks like, that will be implemented at least with some of the changes to mining. But what's the purpose? It doesn't serve to seed the foundations of a economy in the game. My suspicion is mining is going to be integral to development of squadrons and fleet carriers, but, you know, that kind of yet remains to be seen. Still, it kind of gives me a couple of interesting... I wonder what's going on in the back of their minds. They haven't said anything yet, but with some of the changes to the background sim and with the ability to do things like repair stations and stuff like that, it seems like they're adding in the technical elements that they would need to maybe facilitate this with construction of fleet carriers. Well, I have to see more information. Basically, we're waiting for that at this point. So, with this update, the major two things is the introduction of the crate, which is a reimagining updating of a, I guess you could say, fan favorite from 1984 from the original Elite. And man, do I really like this ship. Unfortunately, I think it's rendered just about all of the other medium ships at this point obsolete which may or may not necessarily be a bad thing. It is one of those things, Elite Dangerous. I've been playing it now since 2014 for four years. You know, at some point, I would expect there to be better ships come out. That being said, I've pretty much gotten rid of my Python. I'm probably going to get rid of my FDL. I'm probably going to get rid of the gunship and the Federal Assault ship and just use this as my medium ship and probably my putzing around ship of choice. It is very respectable with the five hard points here. I have three advanced plasma accelerators and two regular PAs, all modded efficiently. These are weapons that I had in storage at Jamison Memorial when the patch launched. I haven't had a lot of time to fly with it. Base out of the gate with a little bit of engineered, uh, getting about 25, 26 light year jump radius with the Guardian jump enhanced FSD module. That becomes about 35 light years, and a couple of my friends that have fully engineered their ships are getting somewhere closer to about 40 light year jump radius with the thing, which is nice. The boost speed that they're getting is in the 530s, which makes it respectable, I think, for PvP. And the weapons placement on this ship is excellent for fixed weapons like plasma accelerators. I guess you could choose your weapons of choice. Uh, that just happened to be weapons that I had engineered lying around. I haven't had a chance to fully engineer mine yet. I need to get out to Professor Palin to do the drives, uh, a couple of other things, but it seemed to have plenty of power. The internal modules are pretty good. It will fit a fighter bay. It is multi-crew capable with a three, with two other chairs for a total of three crew. So it ticks all those boxes, and the interior is very well modeled and includes a couple of things like a coffee maker, which some people say is a nod to the Expanse. Other people say it's kind of a jab at Star Citizen. Either way, I like coffee a lot, so that automatically makes the crate my favorite ship, as opposed to the dropship back in the day where it had an intergalactic Keurig machine. Well, I don't know if it really did or not, but everybody said it had an intergalactic Keurig on both sides. So I kind of like that feature. It's tongue-in-cheek, not very functional or anything like that, but little things like that I do appreciate. As far as other changes to uh, Chapter 2 that I noticed was a lot of changes, or I should say minor bug-fixing changes, more or less. They added mining missions to wing, or wing mining missions, which, hooray? I don't know, I think that might become more important when we start talking about squadrons, fleet carriers, and mining 
in Chapter 4. For right now, none of us ever want to bust another rock again. And some of that is uh, a lot of the people that I fly with. Not all of them, but several of them. We've played another MO, space MMO called Battlestar Galactica Online. And if we never bust another space rock in our lives, you know, <laughs> we did enough of it in that game for a couple of lifetimes. The other major change uh, that I noticed was that um, assassination missions, there's no longer a, a time where ships will spawn. I think that respects players' time a little bit better, so in case, you know, you're playing around and then your daughter starts crying and needs a diaper change, you don't have to worry about coming back in the next 15 minutes, else the target won't spawn. It'll spawn so long as, you know, if it's a three-day time window to complete the mission, you can go into the system, scan the system, and the nav beacon, or use a discovery scanner, and find your target. I like that system a little bit better. The other major change it looked like is to how notoriety uh, works in the crime and punishment system overhaul. You can now apparently turn yourself in if your notoriety is zero, and now notoriety ticks down if you are docked at stations. So what exactly does this do to notoriety now? I mean, it was one of those things before you had to be in space. Not like there wasn't a way to defeat that. You just point your nose in a direction, go at full throttle, and go to bed, log off. Or don't log off, but go to bed, leave the computer running overnight, come back the next day, and if you're not run out of fuel, you know, your notoriety has ticked down. Now you can basically do the same thing minus the risking of running out of fuel, but by just, you know, sitting in a station and letting it run out. Just stay logged in overnight as you go to bed, wake up the next morning, Boom, your notoriety is gone. So I'm not sure what this exactly fixes. I guess an argument could be made if you're in a station in an anarchy system or something like that, and you're outfitting your ship or doing whatever you're doing there, that you know it should tick down in the background while you're actually actively engaged in the game. But I don't think that there's any mechanism there to tell if you're actively engaged with the game or just sitting there letting your time run out. So... It's kind of like a couple of steps forwards, a step and a half back. At this point, again, I don't see where this solves any of the major problems with crime and punishment. And if you notice my earlier videos about the changes to crime and punishment that happened earlier this year, it turned out in praxis I was in practice not a big fan of it. Now, they did correct one other major issue that many of us had with it, and that is they did make it a lot more obvious to what your notoriety level is and how much longer you have until it ticks down in the main user, uh, user interfaces, which is a fantastic addition. One of the big problems that we had with it is it was buried in a menu a couple levels deep, and if you didn't know where to look for it, you wouldn't know this information uh, until you docked up at a station, and even then, I don't think that you knew exactly how much time you had left. So, Chapter 2... I think friends and I are going to probably mount an expedition to go get some more Guardian tech uh, in order to get a couple of the modules, like the Shield Booster module, the FSD booster, and the, the module, I think it is, armor, booster, whatever, and implement that on the crate, as well as other ships. Uh, the 10, 10 and a half light year just added jump range is fantastic on ships like the Corvette, uh, the Cutter. Uh, even in your exploration ship, you know, your your 60 light year ASP becomes a 70 light year ASP. It sucks up a little bit of power, but at any rate, that's one of those things that uh, nice to see. I kind of wonder what else we're going to see in the future and how distances, if, you know, it becomes a 20, 30 light year boost down the line with further advances in the game story land, lines and whatever, the galaxy becomes a much smaller place. And then you get into the situation where I think you start respecting players' time a little bit more and better. It is certainly, after having a kid, uh, kind of one of those things I've come to appreciate a little bit more. Uh, that is certainly for sure. But again, it still doesn't address the fundamental lack of agency that exists within Elite, or I should say doesn't exist within Elite Dangerous. It always comes back to why. What's the point? What's the point of going out and mining if it's not facilitating anything in terms of uh, impact on production? Even if that production was still NPC controlled, but more player influenced to where you could see by bringing 
you know, mineral A, commodity B, results in the production of widget 1, where if you bring X and Y, it produces widget 2 in greater quant quantities and things like that. And there was a supply chain element to the game that was player influenced. And if you did things by mining in a pristine system that's, say, uninhabited, that after you reach a certain threshold, seeking mineral shows up, and then after reaching another threshold, the background sim would start populating the system with maybe a planetary outpost or a surface base that would be like a refinery, and then based on the materials, you start trading with that, build constructions of stations, and you know you could affect a system's economy and grow it organically with more colonists and things like that with passenger missions things of that nature organically through the background sim, which was kind of what we thought we were getting uh, when station building was first, quote, introduced in the 1.1 trailer, what, three and a half years ago at this point? But those would be the elements that I think could start really bringing me back to Elite Dangerous. In the meantime, I've gotten back into DCS in a big way with several of my friends and expect a lot more video content coming with just flight sims in general because I thought I had done a lot of reviews of flight sim modules for FSX and X-Plane and stuff like that over the last couple of years and apparently I have not so I'm going to be going back and producing that content uh, with my daughter being around that it's actually stuff that I can do in the daytime so thank you very much for watching and be sure to like subscribe and I will see you next time